is the general manager of Go Resilient, a national supplier of LVT products. Tim is one of the pioneers of LVT, having introduced Candine design flooring to the Canadian market in 1998. Traveling coast to coast, Tim has worked tirelessly educating retailers on the various features and benefits of this popular product category before distribution welcomed LVT into the mainstream. Now, most suppliers are able to provide multiple options utilizing various application methods, including glue down, loose lay, and rigid core. So without further ado, I'll hand the uh, screen over to Tim and uh, take it from there, Tim. Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> yes, this started uh, many, many years ago. Uh, kind of feel like the guy, the folk singer in a Volkswagen van playing small gigs for about 10 years. LVT really wasn't important. Laminate was still very much on the priority list for everybody. And then all of a sudden, overnight, there became a sensation and everybody else jumped into the fray, which is great because it helped elevate the category. So I've been given this opportunity. I'm, I'm really uh, feel fortunate about that. But I wanted to uh, uh, forewarn you that these circumstances, obviously, with the pandemic, we're doing things uh, non face to face. And so it's very difficult to do anything to do with installation that's tactile. And I know this is a tactile business. So I'm going to use a more cerebral approach because I think we have to get up at 10,000 feet and start looking at this uh, to make sure that we're all successful in this category is because if you win, my competitors win, we all win together. So uh, what we're going to be talking about and really more specifically what we're not going to be talking about, uh, I won't be talking about our brand. It's inconsequential in the grand scheme of things here. It's an LVT, as are there many other successful LVTs in the marketplace. So this presentation is designed really to talk about LVT, not brands. The second thing is... Um, <clears throat> If it's available uh, by reading our instructions or your competitors or our competitors instructions or other suppliers instructions, I'm really not going to talk about it because those instructions are really there for you to tuck into and get into the right headspace around the products to make sure that you're successful with them. So it's an obligation that you have to your customer, to yourself to get it right and spend a little bit of time doing that. Um, you know, I will be talking because the title is Effective Behaviors around what is an effective behavior and why does it matter. Uh, and then I want to keep to the simple principles of having fun, making money and doing it right. This is, these are guiding, these are the tail feathers of our business that it's not worth doing as, unless it really lines up with all three things. And you could argue, why would you do it if it, it doesn't make you any money? Why would you do it if you're not having fun doing it? Uh, and why would you do it if you're not doing the right thing by all the stakeholders, meaning yourself, your family, your customers, your suppliers. And last thing I would say is that, sorry, this is really about focusing your energies in this presentation on a learning mindset, you know, because there is a high risk. I'm running a razor wire here that, oh, he's just dumping on the installer or he's just dumping on the salesperson in the shop. But the fact of the matter is I'm not, I'm saying we need to take a step back because we're so caught up in what we do and how we go about it that we need to reevaluate constantly. The fact that you're on this call is a great first step in that direction. But to start, I want to talk about you know, effective behaviors, and I can't really do that without talking about core responsibilities. You know, If you had a job description handed to an employee, it's going to have core responsibilities or better known as skills. So I've just flushed out very quickly uh, ones that you'd find in the installation arena around the installation of many products, but particular uh, LVT. Estimating, measuring and marking, mixing and spreading, even as far as cleaning up, cutting and fitting. I don't know if I've sat in a commercial bathroom or stood rather in a commercial bathroom and looked at an LVT plank cut around a clean out drain that's not been, looks like it's been cut by a pair of kindergarten scissors. So, you know, every element of this is a skill is it being treated as a skill? Is it being measured as a skill? And that's where effective behaviors come in. So what is an effective behavior? Simple terms, it's knows how to or knows how to do something, is able to do it and can demonstrate it, that they can do it, right? And I don't know if we spend enough time because this business is broken up between manufacturer, wholesaler, retailer, installer. And we're all kind of separate entities for the most part 
So does anybody really stop and take stock of this sort of thing? If it was somebody working within our company in any given job, we always uh, line up the core responsibilities. We always challenge with the effective behaviors. And when it comes to reviewing somebody, they know how to do this. Can they demonstrate it? Are they able to? Knows if we're getting good value for the money. So in following that thread, I would say that the skill in this particular case is measuring, marking, and layouts. So that's a skill. Seems pretty straightforward. And I think that's largely where it gets left. But the reality is if we apply the effective behaviors to that, then we get the knows how to. Seems pretty straightforward, simple, using measuring tools, tape measures, standard levels, laser levels, the list will go on. Second thing is, are they able to? Can they convert units of measure? You know, the, the trades quite often will get somebody that hasn't completed their high school. Nothing wrong with that. They're very skilled, tactile, able to do the job, but did we measure against whether or not they can actually read imperial or metric? And finally, demonstrates basic math skills. Again, high school or less than high school education. Can they add and subtract? Can they use a calculator? Have they kept up with their skills to be able to convert fractions? All of those are applicable skills uh, when it comes to measuring marking and layout. So this was a slide that I think has application across a broad band of skills in this discipline. And if it's not already there, if you're running a crew, if you're running a company um, uh, in company installers, uh, then it may be something, or if you're running an apprentice, it may be something that you're looking for that you could use to make sure when you're hiring, that you've got exactly what you need to fulfill the obligation of doing a proper installation. Just looking at it, sorry, uh, one step further, uh, what's really important, knows how and uh, when and how to challenge. This is something that we're often afraid to because if I'm a, an installer or the English call a fitter, I might not be wanting to mess around with my supplier's customer but it, it's a point in the chain where everything can start to break down. If something's not right and you don't know how to challenge, then there could be trouble on the horizon. More importantly, if it escalates, then obviously being able to walk away is another important skill. And it could be something on the, on the, you know, that lays at the feet of the supplier that they delivered uh, an, a product that's uh, out of spec, uh, defective, whatever the case may be, you need to know to walk away and leave the job so it doesn't get any worse. Is able to, perhaps the more important one, and that, that, that sorry, relating back to that, is able to walk away. Knowing how to do it is one thing, being able to do it is a completely different thing, takes more fortitude. If you to pick up on that, this is a great slide, Tim, uh, but if you're, uh, challenging if you're looking to challenge your general contractor with the constructor you've got to be able to and if for example English is a second language really hard to get your message across as to why technically you might want to stop and pull off and justify that so it's a great slide thank you I want to just walk you through quickly the the history because I've been doing this a long time um, and I've seen the evolution of uh, the LVT category. And of course, this is a, an exploded view of one of our products. Uh, in very simple terms, it has a PU wear layer. Back in the day, lots of claims and complaints were established on the fact that products scuffed very easily. So uh, they got clever and got PU in into the build of the product without um, uh, marring the visual that's the money uh, component of it, the, the look of the wood or the tile. Then it has a PVC wear layer. Then the expensive part, if, you, if you're buying high-end products, you're gonna have a, a fair chunk of investment in making sure your visuals are spot on and then a stabilizing layer and then a supportive PVC back layer to reduce indentation and give you something better to bond to. So that's where we started with this. That uh, sort of encompasses a cornucopia of skills uh, that we talk a lot about but then all of a sudden somebody uh, comes up with a butter mousetrap and they introduce loosely. Same overall construction. The only sort of difference here 
in the core of the product would be more fiberglass to stabilize the product because you're not you know, intending to use uh, adhesive or as much adhesive in this particular case. And then of course, you've got a, a backing, uh, a bottom layer that's supposed to keep the product from moving about. So we're trying to eliminate in this particular uh, makeup, uh, one element, which is largely adhesive. It also afforded us the opportunity to go over painted floors, which you weren't able to do before without scarifying them and or some other substrates that you wouldn't have been able to get away with without overboarding. So it, it seemed to be a bit of a panacea and it had uh, mass appeal for a while. Uh, but once people lost confidence in its ability to stay put with the recommended adhesive, they started spreading out the whole area and it just became another glue down product and the focus flipped. And this is the important thing. The selling narrative flipped from um, you know, it's loose leg capability to its sickness because normally uh, an LVT product would be two, two and a half, three mil thick. This is 5.5, five is better than three. Then that's where the story started to go. I'm not suggesting for a second that's right, but that's the way as humans, we tend to do things. And then, oh, I just missed the, the old laminate days. It was so simple. You didn't need a lot of tools easy to install, can bang in a lot of these floors very quickly and uh, happy days, happy days. So again, we're looking at a construction, you know, PU wear layer, wear layer, print film, stabilizing layer with the clicking mechanism on it and a sound attenuation backing layer. Now I have to say this, that the sound attenuation component was probably the most attractive in terms of delivering volume back to the supply side because LVT was largely excluded from multifamily residential or high rise buildings or condos because of sound. And that that construction with that sound atten attenuating backing on it made it much more attractive and, and user friendly and usable in those environments. But again, the thing that we have to contemplate if we're deriving our living from um, uh, LVT, it started with a much more complex installation process to get a proper glue down floor and the benefits were you could do many more design oriented things in terms of your layouts with a you know straight edge and a utility knife loose lay fold pretty much in that vein as well but then when we get into the rigid cores each iteration removes a level of sophistication on the installation side and so we're opening it up for less skilled people. We're opening it up for consumers. Uh, and there's only a finite supply of available opportunity. So eventually you're cutting your own grass if we move completely in one direction. So in saying that, I would focus your skill set on the most complicated product in the category. The rest you can do if you can do the first one. And then if you can do the glue down and do it effectively, then the world is your oyster because not everybody can do that. Just want to put some context, you know, because this is a, an industry, as I mentioned earlier, where we're in compartments. We've got the supplier, the manufacturing side, the wholesaler side, the retailer side, and the installation side, and everybody locks into their silo the moment something goes wrong. So I, I put these slides in uh, not to ignite, but to just put context to it so we know that we can have open conversations about it and we understand everybody's part in the chain. So in terms of the manufacturing side, there's chemists, engineers involved in the design of the product. It goes through a machine that's calibrated with professional people that work those machines day in, day out, and then goes through quality control. And from quality control, it ends up in a box on a pallet and then eventually in a container and on a ship hopefully not just sitting off Victoria on fire. But that said, that ship eventually arrives in Canada and ends up on a rail in, in a wholesaler's uh, building. To that point, everything is very, very controlled. Then it gets broken down into individual order sizes. It may stay as a pallet or may get broken down into a couple of boxes, 10, 15 boxes of pail of glue. And then it ends up on a truck. So far, everything is reasonably controlled and routine. Where it starts to go into the variables, if we just throw a number out there, had 500 customers, 
each customer has two salespeople just making it up. We've just taken, uh, and we, we, we all are, are trying to be educated from competing interests. The, the likelihood that one supplier tells you something that's contradicted by another supplier leaves a recipe in the retail shop of all sorts of different bits of information. So we've taken some system that's reasonably fluid and all of a sudden now we have a variable of a thousand different people with all sorts of different bits of information from different suppliers. And then that gets passed to installers who also uh, multiply another 2000 installers in the marketplace that are all getting inputs from different uh, vested interests. So you can start to see that no longer is this flow smooth, it starts to get a bit chunky. And then it gets into the house. Now, I don't know uh, a place in the world where houses are all built from exactly the same materials in exactly the right climate. If you're looking at Canada, we could be supplying, we just sold a job up in uh, Nuvik, which on, is on the or, or above the Arctic Circle, and we've got it sold in Victoria, Windsor, St. John's, Newfoundland, all over the place. Different materials, different ages of the house, so you start to see this gets a bit more complicated. Now, the reality is engineers and scientists and chemists design the products to fit many of those situations, but it's all tied into a set of criteria. And um, here's where it starts to go awry. This is, is really about the installation community and decision making. <clears throat> So you've bid a job or you've got a standard, standard set price for doing an installation, and then you've got a choice. Do you want to hold on to that whole price or do you want to make choices that could put it at risk? And in some cases, it can go horribly wrong. So what are those things? Handling. Good example the other day, the receiving of the product is ultimately the responsibility of the retailer. There are mistakes that happen. We had one where somebody picked a product that would, had 41 in the product code and there was VGW41 and RP41. They picked the wrong one and 8,000 feet got installed until somebody said, hey, that wasn't the floor that I ordered. <laughs> or somebody received product for stair nosings, didn't receive it actually, just passed it through to the guys making the stair nosings and found out about a week later that they had stair nosings that weren't actually have any use to them. So the handling is ultimately the responsibility of the retailer, but it's also something that the uh, installation community can double check. It's just one of those stop gaps along the way. Storage and acclimation. Is it getting to the job site before the installation is uh, actually taking place? Is the climate control within the, the boundaries of what's being described for the product and for the adhesive? Is the moisture been checked? Hmm, didn't feel moist, didn't smell any mold, but quite often it gets overlooked because somebody doesn't want to pay for it. Is the floor prep been recommended or did we avoid it on the sales floor because it just, there's a, a risk that I would lose the sale to another shop down the street who wasn't going to talk about it. And then adhesive application. Am I going to follow the instructions that's, uh, that are on the pail? Did I pick or did we supply the right adhesive for this application? Um, and then have I got the requisite skills to mark out and cut and fit this room according uh, to the customer's requirements? As you can see, in any one of these situations, you miss one and you've got a real problem on your answer potentially. So it's about keeping as much money and not losing it because you decided or chose to miss one of the important elements of, of proper installation. Pushing the limits is a great metaphor, you know, the speed limit on the road, 100K an hour. Most people are doing 120, 130. You know, you can get away with it, but the road was designed for 100. So if there's a crash, the difference between 100 and 130 is exponentially worse if you get crashed at 130. We've seen it over and over again where a truck picks up the product on a cold day, throws in the back of a pickup truck, 10 boxes going to a job site, and guess what? We know they're going to install it. There's a lot, very little we can do about it. 
but you just sort of squeeze your cheeks together and wait for something bad to happen. So receipt of goods is important in the chain that it makes sure that the product is properly received, not only in the retail space in the right time frame, but also on the job site in the right time frame. How that product is handled. If you're running up and downstairs carrying a box of 59 inch plank on your shoulder and it's bouncing, you're inclined to stretch it. Don't really notice it. Doesn't really look to be moving, but eventually it will sort itself back out. If you install it right away, you might find yourself with a bit of a gapping issue. And temperature control. Contractors that have sold tract housing typically don't like to keep the heat on. They don't want to pay for it if they don't have to. So they keep the heat as low as they possibly can. And even you say that the job of the product has been there to acclimatize, uh, you go in and turn the heat up to meet the requirements of the adhesive and the installation, but you're changing the dynamic of that product while it's on site. And the net effect is you might have a gap in claim. So all of these things are choices that you can make uh, in the process to reduce without pushing the limits. Any company worth their salt, particularly in an industry that's on fire with a category that's on fire is tracking. When there's a challenge to their product, they're going to track it. And so I'm giving you a record of the things that we've tracked over many years. And the ones in red are ones that I would deem are not related to the product. Gapping, everybody would be a gasp or you're a BS artist. But the, the reality is we know before that product comes out of the box that if you heat it up, it will grow. If you cool it down, it will shrink back to its original shape. And so the adhesive in combination with the plank is a system and they have to work in concert with each other. When we see a gapping claim, we know that something in that chain has broken and then it gets very emotional. So the other ones marked in red are things that we feel and have seen that can be detected usually before we get too far into a job, again, stopping a disaster from unfolding. And then there's obviously things like product defects happen, delamination from period periodically happens, discoloration, shipping errors, all those different things are things that can happen. But the ones that we would consider unrelated to uh, the product manufacturer 70% of them are, you know, human decision making. So then it begs the question, when I look at this slide, I've got some disasters here. The question is choice or skill. And because we're not in front of each other, I can't ask you to raise your hand and ask the question. So I'm going to expedite this. Those are all choice. Now, in this particular case, the bottom right corner is the wrong board but the whoever quoted the job quoted proper quarter inch underlayment but substituted something less than that there's seven emails in the thread saying do not install our product over cork and yet the customer wanted a cushiony floor so they uh capitulated and in doing the investigation found out on the invoice for the adhesive they didn't even buy the right amount of adhesive to do the cork and the net effect was the top left corner, which is lumpy, bumpy, ugly floor. That cost the retailer $28,000 in cash to remedy that situation and never to see that customer or any of their friends ever again. So there's choice and then there's skill. Bottom left, I would attribute to skill. It's hard to see. It's not a great photograph, but I'm pulling from things that have happened over time. And you can see trial marks. Just grow into your grocery store along one of the cool counters where they've used a burnishing machine and see all the trial marks from all the uh, prep that's been done over the course of time. But this one, they didn't get all the trial marks out of their prep and they glued right over top and it telegraphed through. Eventually, a fishing line will telegraph through a floor. So these things we can't overlook. Another one, I was on this job site actually a beautiful layout. So uh, I, I, the guy had the skill, uh, but I also know the homeowner, it's a custom build home and the homeowner was uh, over his shoulder constantly. But this adhesive, you look at the left side, that adhesive required 90% coverage. Looks like they got in too late and they didn't roll the floor. Same room, different side of the room, looks like it didn't even use the same trowel. 
So these are sort of things that we would look to to make sure that the adhesive uh, has been used appropriately if we see something related to gapping. The floor, or the, the adhesive is very sticky, will hold the floor down, but it's the lateral movement that is the real uh, more challenging thing. And that's where people get confused because they say, well, it's stuck like crazy. It may be stuck like crazy, but I can stick a wet spatula on a flat counter and have trouble pulling it up. But getting that, I can also slide that spatula around the counter in any one direction and then get it to some air and pop it up. So this is a good example of that, where it's been stuck. Everybody thinks it's the product, but it's actually an installation issue. The old fork in the road, opportunity cost is something you give up. It's lost opportunity. And it happens in our industry more than you like to think because we don't think somebody's prepared to pay anything. You know, you watch what the average price of a, a vinyl plank or tile is now compared to where it was six months ago, and yet everybody's still paying and they're paying more for it. So it points more to the fact that we don't know what the consumer will bear until we ask the right questions. Now I'm gonna go down a totally different track here. I like to take pictures. And when I travel, I like to have a good quality camera with me. I don't wanna use a, a phone to take a picture because I might get a good shot. I want to blow it up. So I bought this camera. Let's say I paid $300 for it. And then I got it back to the house, started looking at it and realized I'm looking at basically an iPhone. And I wasn't really thrilled with it. So I did my own research and I found that it came with an optical viewfinder as an accessory. So I went back to my retailer and said, could you buy this for me? And his first reaction is, you, that's expensive. You don't want to pay for that. And I said, try me. So I forced him to buy it. But there's a great example. He was assuming that I wasn't prepared to pay. Now, camera was $300. That viewfinder, let's call it $200. I put it on the camera. It transformed it. Now I was looking through the viewfinder, composing my shots. Totally different experience. So I said to the retailer, who was a friend of mine, I said, would you mind me uh, doing me a favor? Bring in more of those viewfinders. And when you show that camera, show the camera first. Let the customer handle the camera, and then say, look, this other component isn't part of the camera. It's an accessory and you have to pay for it, but I want you to see it on here before you walk out the store. I would ask again, if we were in a group where I could look you straight in the eye and say, how, much, how many people actually bought that viewfinder when they were shown that way? The answer is four out of five people bought the viewfinder. So they came in with a $300 budget and they spent 500 plus with that viewfinder, but they were much happier. So, you know, I hear it all the time. I get to travel across the country and I hear people don't want to pay for it, or this is a test town. It's different here. I've heard that in London. I've heard it in Winnipeg. I've heard it in Calgary. Everywhere seems to feel that they're different. The reality is the flooring industry is notorious for giving up money by selling an inferior product or excluding some major component that's key to the installation. Uh, and that money is being spent in another retail space. I, I cringe every time I see a flat screen TV coming out from Best Buy because I know somebody in the flooring industry might have sold somebody something less than they should have. So they will pay if you, write, if you ask the, the right question. The right question would be, here's evidence on the left that that's how your floor should look when I'm done. Or if we choose to cut some corners or not pay for stuff that I think you should have, and this conversation belongs to both the retail side of the business as well as the installation side of the business, that I can give it to you the way it was intended, or I can give it to you potentially this way. There's no guarantee that I can get it like that, but it may end up like that if we don't do the proper floor prep or use the right board or do all those sorts of things. So the questions that you ask will, so if you're skilled, and again, said this is, requires a learning mindset, we have to kind of take what we've done in the past and challenge it at every turn to see, could we be doing something different? Could we be doing something better than we were before? Or are we falling into very predictable traps uh, by just being lazy? So I, I would suggest the net effect of doing it the other way is that you might make more money and you'll deliver better results. So in summary, you know, success is not somewhere you arrive. Destinations tend to have a shelf life. You know, even if you're at the most luxurious resort, you'll get bored after about three weeks. 
And the other thing is becoming a master requires a learning mindset, but most importantly, uh, people can't get past the boredom and routine. And there's always boredom and routine in doing things that take you to mastery. I want to thank you. Uh, I've been given it. I could talk, talk to bark off a tree, truthfully, but I've only been given 20 and I've already gone 30. So I would say this, that this is a chain. You know, the sales uh, and installation of, of LVT is a chain. I mentioned the four different components, manufacturer, wholesaler, retailer, and installer. Uh, and we all work in these silos. And as soon as something goes wrong and there's a break in the chain, we pitch up against each other. And I'm so excited about what's going on with these presentations. This is an opportunity to break down some of those barriers and get some dialogue going between the various parties to make sure that we can do a better job and ultimately have more fun, make more money and do right. And I want to acknowledge you for coming on and uh, extend some gratitude for your participating and, and listening to what I have to say. Thank you.